This is the second episode of the sketches of Jacob Parkhurst by himself. This story was written by Jacob Parkhurst. It was typewritten and found in a file of genealogical materials passed down from my great aunt. It turns out that this autobiographical sketch has been reprinted many times, but not been published freely on the web or as a podcast. This story starts before the United States declared independence from Great Britain. Jacob was 12 years old and living in a stockade fort in Hampshire County, West Virginia. The story winds its way with Jacob's travels up and down the frontier along the Ohio River. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's tale from the end of the road. Part 2 Sketches of Jacob Parkhurst by Himself When the hunting was mostly over, I made me a little smokehouse and dressed the skins that I had killed and sold some, with the proceeds of which I got me a pair of pantaloons, for we now began to prepare to go to Pennsylvania. About the middle of February 1791, Mr. Allen and I wound up our business and took leave of our friends and fellow rangers at North Bend and went up to Cincinnati in order to get a passage up to Wheeling or to Pennsylvania, but finding no passage for some days, we went up to Columbia where we found two large canoes, and about 18 or 19 men, bound for Wheeling. We obtained passage with them on condition that we would walk part of the way, to which we agreed in order to get our knapsacks carried, and as there was danger of Indians along the river. Sometime in the latter part of February, we set sail from Columbia for limestone. Some rode, some walked on land, the weather being fine and the river clear of ice. In the afternoon, however, a heavy fall of snow commenced which continued until some time in the night when the snow was about knee-deep. We landed our canoes about sunset and prepared for the night as well as we could. We found a large hollow sycamore with a hole in one side, which held part of the men, the other scraped away the snow and laid down three in a bed, having one blanket under and two over them. Having previously taken supper in the tremendous snowstorm, we went to bed and the snow covered us up over our head and ears, though rather cold at first, yet when we awoke in the night we were sweating, for our covering was heavy. The snow ceased sometime in the night and turned to rain, which settled the snow. Towards day it cleared off and froze a crust on the snow. In the morning after taking breakfast about thirteen of us set out on foot, and we had not only to break the snow but the crust, which we did by marching in Indian file till the leader was nearly exhausted when he fell back in the rear and so on alternately until all had served their tour. To our mortification the canoes left us, having promised to wait at the mouth of a creek which was at some distance ahead when we parted, but they broke their promise and left us to shift for ourselves, without provisions or blankets which were in their canoes. We traveled all that day through the snow and crust and managed to get across the waters by sliding on long poles, the ice not being strong enough to carry us without some aid. When night came on we halted without much ceremony for we had neither blankets nor provisions. We scraped away the snow and gathered some sticks to make a fire, but we had no supper to cook, the snow crust being so hard that we could not get nigh any game but we contented ourselves as well as we could. One of Jacob Allen's moccasins had failed so that his foot came in the snow, and I cut off my pantaloons below the knee and made him a moccasin, and had long cloth leggings. Then we fixed ourselves down as well as we could near our fires, but the night was frosty, and I got to sleep with my hand under head, my fingers being next to the snow so that two of them got frosted and were blistered the next day. The next morning we got up without breakfast or dinner and traveled through the snow until about sunset. We got to Lee's Creek Station, where we found plenty of log cabins and corn dodgers and some old acquaintances from Pennsylvania who were very kind to us. The next day we got a passage in a keelboat belonging to a Mr. Boone and ran up to Limestone where the canoes that had left us had landed but could give no good account of their conduct. We then went to Washington, in Kentucky, a small town of log cabins and some hard cider, which came from Redstone Country, and went to work for some shoes, for we were almost barefoot. Here I found my sister Rhoda, also Grandfather Parkhurst was there, and about to move to Lexington, also Cousin Jeb Grund lived in town and I worked for him for about half a month. About this time we heard of a keelboat at the landing, that was laden with bacon and butter, bound for Galliopolis, belonging to Captain Strong of Cincinnati. We then went and took a passage to be boarded for our work and company, which swelled the number of the crew to forty men, twenty spare hands, for the boat worked twenty oars. So we were divided into companies, twenty to walk two hours, and then relieve the oarsmen. I think we started on Tuesday, sometime in the forepart of March, just after a great rain, the river is high, some of the first days, we scarce got ten miles a day, 
and it was all a wilderness from limestone to Galliopolis. We passed the mouth of Scioto, on Saturday evening, a while before night, which was called 60 miles from limestone. We had then been five days on board. The river had fallen, and we were making fine headway. We camped at night, on the bank of the river and Sunday morning, got early breakfast and set sail in fine spirits, but to our surprise, we soon discovered two fresh moccasin tracks on the sand, which we supposed to be Indians. We then called a halt and held a council of war for we expected to be attacked, and that those two Indians had been spying us at our camp, the night before. We resolved that if we were attacked, the boat should land, turn out and help us fight if given any chance, if not, take the sufferers in if possible. It was also resolved that a flank guard of three men be sent into the bottom to reconnoiter, while the balance followed the footpath as usual. I turned out with a flanking party, as I expected the Indians to waylay the path, and take all advantage, as I had been too long on the frontier not to know something about Indian warfare. We again proceeded, and it was my turn on land, and my lot as one of the flank guards, while the seventeen proceeded along the footpath. We had scarcely traveled one hour until we came into a thick underwood so that the flank guard could not discover the main body. We heard one rifle fire, which caused us to halt when a heavy firing took place, and the savage yell rent the air. The two boys that were with me started towards the river hill, quartering a little down the river the direction to limestone, but I had no notion to leave my company, so I ran towards the action until I came fair view when I took a tree and thought to try to shoot an Indian but I discovered there was no stand made by our men, they appeared to be shot down or retreating. What few were left, trying to reach the boat, and the Indians very numerous, I thought best not to discharge my gun, nor disclose myself. As the Indians was now between me and the boat, I ran up the river about a half mile where I sat down to listen for the boat, which I expected would run across the river, and proceed on the other side, but I never saw her again, but I afterward heard the boat attempted to land, but there was one of our men came to the bank, and he appeared to be wounded. The boat was in the act of landing when the Indians fired from the bank into the boat and killed one man and wounded two more. She then turned and attempted to cross to the other side, but discovered the Indians preparing to receive them, she then turned down the river and went back to Limestone. The party that went up from Washington to bury the dead, supposed the Indians to be about 200 strong and followed them about 20 miles up the Scioto River but having so much the start they could not overtake them. Out of the seventeen persons on land, only one made his escape, in the boat, one man was killed and two others wounded. I will here state some of my own troubles, which were just commencing, after deliberating, and counting the cost as well as I could, a beardless youth in a strange wilderness, infested by a savage foe, I concluded to try at all hazards, to make the best of my way up the river towards Pennsylvania. I knew that it was about 100 miles to Galliopolis, which I expected I could travel in three days, by traveling some by moonlight, so I shouldered my rifle, starting with some resolution for Pennsylvania. I traveled hard the remainder of the day, without interruption, until about sunset. When I came to a large creek, with the backwater ebbing from the river, so there was no chance for me to cross, I turned up the creek, to seek for a chance to cross, I continued up the creek until sundown, the turkeys, which were plenty, were flying up to roost. I leveled at one of them and brought it down and picking it up ran on a piece and reloaded my gun and continued on until dark. I then struck fire in a dead white oak, which was rotten on the outside and easy to kindle. I fell to roasting and eating my turkey without salt or bread, which was my only chance for supper. I roasted about a pound of the breast to eat the next day until roosting time. By this time the fire had run up the tree so high that it lighted the wood so, I thought it was best to travel on as the moon was up, and I feared the Indians might discover my fire, so I traveled up the creek which still appeared like a pond of dead water and no chance to cross. At length, I came to a branch putting into the creek which was about waist deep, which I waited. I had now gone some miles up the creek and found it ran with some current, but was too deep to wade, and there was neither log drift across it, so I again struck fire on the bank of the creek, and lay down to sleep, but I did not sleep much, for my fire was poor, and a part of my clothes was wet, and the night frosty, so that I had to turn off into warm. The owls hooted, the wolves howled and the turkeys gobbled. When daylight came, I gathered my gun which lay by my side and started up the creek to search for a place to cross, but the stream was large and neither log nor drift appeared until I came to an island in the creek, and there was a drift over the first part of the creek so that I got on the island. 
I then searched the other side for a bridge, but behold there was none. I, therefore, concluded that I must cross at all events, so I found a long dry log, that lay with one end in the water, which I thrust into the water with all the force that I was master of, and then jumped on the end of it, in hope that the force of the chute would carry me across the deepest of the water, so that I could wade out, and keep my gun and powder dry, but the stream being wider than I had calculated, and of a strong current, my boat did not reach halfway across, until it headed downstream with a whirl that threw me overboard in spite of all my endeavors to balance her. I gripped my gun and felt for the bottom, but could not find any, I then struck to swim, still holding fast to my gun, but when my clothes became filled with water, and a heavy pair of shoes which I had on, I found it impossible for me to swim out it and carry my gun, so with the greatest reluctance, I let it go to the bottom, and with much ado I got out, pulling myself up by some willows that grew at the edge of the water, on a steep bank which I had to ascend, which I did with difficulty, about the time the sun shone on the hills. Leaving my gun seemed to cast a heavy gloom over my mind, and when I came to examine my powder, I found it all wet, I, therefore, tried to make the best of it, concluding that I could cross the waters for the future without so much difficulty, so I started in a trot across the bottom, to try to warm myself, but had not gone far until I started a gang of buffaloes. I then struck for the river, which I soon found. I had nothing to hinder me from traveling, no cooking or making fires. So I traveled on until towards the middle of the day, which was Monday when I came to another creek, which appeared almost as large as the one I had crossed in the morning, now said I to myself, I have no gun to lose, so I'll be right across, so I gathered two long poles that were some crooked, and laid them together and straddled them, for I did not like to get all over wet, so I paddled with my hands, until I reached near the middle, when my poles spread apart, and let me down between them, so that I had to swim out, and went on my way, but to my mortification, I found that the stream I had crossed, was only a bayou or arm of the river, so I had it to cross again. I found by an examination, that the pawpaw bark would peel, so I peeled some bark, and gathered some chunks and tied them together with the bark so that I had a raft that I could sit on, and keep the upper part of my body dry, so I paddled across the bayou again. I then traveled on till night without much opposition. As to my provision, the small slices of half-roasted meat was all my dependence. When I felt the keenest appetite, I would take a small allowance of my fresh meat, but next thing was how I should lodge, so I went on to the top of the river hill, by the side of an old log, and gathered a pile of leaves, and lay down amongst them, with my back to the log, and took a nap, being weary and fatigued with traveling, but when I awoke, I was very cold, as my clothes were wet, and the night frosty, so I got up and discovering that the moon had risen, so I traveled on till I came to a branch that put into the river, so I took off my shoes to wade, and carried them in my hand, while the water was draining from off my legs. I had begun to think that the Indians that were watching the river, were left behind, but while I was walking solitarily along the footpath, all of a sudden I saw a fire of coals, a little to the left of my path, near the bank of the river. At the same instant that I saw the fire, an Indian who was on watch, saw me, by the brightness of the moon. I then wheeled to the right and ran across the bottom towards the hill. The Indian that was on guard, cried Wu. Something like a hog when he gives the alarm, which made a great stir in the camp, and they all appeared to be in motion. I then made tracks as fast as I could across the bottom, as a retreat was my only chance for safety, I ran with all my might, for the Indian who was on guard, was hard after me, and in the midst of the race, some unseen brush or stick caught one of my feet, which came near turning me a somerset, and by spreading my hands to save my head, my shoes which I was yet carrying, flew to one side, which I had not time to hunt, but gathering myself, I ran on until I reached the hill. When I found that I was gaining on my pursuer, I ascended the hill and got amongst the rocks, and saw the Indian no more. My breath being nearly spent, I sat down behind a rock, almost in despair, my gun was gone, and my shoes were gone also, and now I shall perish in this wilderness. But it seemed like a voice said to me, the same hand of providence that has preserved you this far, is able and willing to preserve you through all those dangers and difficulties for a purpose of his own glory, which seemed to renew my courage, and I responded, Lord if thou wilt deliver me from all these dangers and trials, I will be thy obedient servant the remainder of my days. But oh! The folly of such promises for Jesus hath said, Without me, ye can do nothing. I then started anew, to travel by moonlight, barefooted as I was, but the weather began to moderate, so that I managed to get along with my bare feet, until towards day, 
when I gathered another bed of leaves and took a nap. In the morning I started early, having nothing to hinder me, not even to put on my shoes. I kept along the hillside, and across the points, concluding the Indians were near the river, watching the boats. So I traveled this morning which was Tuesday until I came on the top of the point, and casting my eyes down to my left, saw an Indian, we seemed to be passing each other, he saw me, at the same time I saw him. Now was the time I missed my gun, but having the advantage of the ground, in two or three jumps, I was out of his sight, he spoke as I started, in broken English and cried out stop. Me ish white man too, but I paid no attention to him, for want of my gun. I ran circling around the point and up the branch until I came to a cave of rock in the hillside, which I slipped under, while I gained my breath, I then crept out, but saw my Indian white man no more. I concluded to steer across the hills in order to escape the red men. I started from the cave across the hills, keeping as near as I could guess, the course of the river, guiding my course by the sun in the daytime, and by night the North Star was my guide. So I traveled on through the remainder of Tuesday through green briars and rocks over mountains and the hills, until night came on when I gathered my bed after the usual manner and went to rest, among the mountains near Big Sandy. The next morning, which was Wednesday, I came to a large creek, which I supposed to be Big Sandy, which I crossed with a raft as before. Near to this creek, I started a gang of buffaloes and two large bears, but these appeared friendly for where the wild game was plenty, the Indians were scarce. This morning was pleasant, and but a light frost, but towards the middle of the day, the sun grows dim, and I concluded to try to find the river, for said I if I lose sight of the sun, I shall soon starve to death here in the mountains, and I might as well perish by the sword, as by famine, I started towards the river, which I found about the middle of the day. I then traveled the rest of the day along the foot of the hill. When night came on, I still traveled a little by the moonlight. I then went up the hill, gathered my bed, and went to rest. We will return to our story after this short message. We will return to our story. When I arose next morning, which was Thursday, I found my feet very much swollen, and scratched by the briars and cracked with the march winds, so I concluded if I did not get the relief that day, I should have to give up the chase. I had been saving my fresh meat, and think I ate the last of it this morning, it was a piece of bone with some meat on it, which was badly tainted but tasted good to me. I frequently chewed spee brows and elm buds, so that I scarcely went a mile without browsing at something. It would be in vain for me to describe the reflections of my mind. I often thought of the abused mercies of God, by those who live in plenty, those who cannot eat this, that, nor the other wholesome food. But to return. The weather now became pleasant and I traveled on as fast as I could, until about the middle of the day, when I came to a large creek or river, near the banks of which, I discovered two moccasin tracks, which appeared to be fresh, making up the stream, which I believed to be Indian tracks, which gave me some uneasiness, while I had to gather materials for a raft, and cross the stream by paddling with my hands. This was the last stream I had to ferry. This afternoon became cloudy, and like for rain, which terminated in a thunder gust, but I found a large hollow sycamore log that lay up from the ground, that was burned on the underside which sheltered me from the rain, but when the rain ceased, I traveled on, though weary and faint. How to fix my lodging, I could not tell for my bed was wet and my clothes were also wet with the bushes and weeds, but I concluded to hunt along the river hill, amongst the rocks for a cave with leaves in it, which I had frequently seen, I could find plenty of rocks, but no leaves under them, when dark came on, I crawled under one of the rocks, that made a small cave, but no leaves under it, so I crawled between it and the ground and fell asleep, but when I awoke, I was shivering with cold, for the rock was cold, and the ground was as cold as ice, so I crept out and started on the search for better lodgings, but had not gone far until I found a cave with plenty of leaves in it, so I made up my bed, and crawled into it, and slept until sunrise. In which nap, I had a dream. I dreamed that I was on the river bank, and saw a boat coming down the river, to which I called aloud, and she came ashore, and behold my mother was in the boat and had a large loaf of bread. So I awoke, and behold it was a dream. Notwithstanding it was a dream, it encouraged me some, and I had much need of encouragement, for as I came out of my bedroom, my feet were so swollen and sore, that it seemed hard work to put them to the ground, but I broke me a cane and managed to hobble along until my blood became circulated, when I did not feel so bad, but had nothing for breakfast but brows, 
having gone to bed without my supper, but I traveled on until toward noon when I found a few beech nuts, which served for my dinner. At this time I was met with encouragement, for I found that the bushes had been cut, and lopped on each side of the path, which I supposed were cut by the hunters from Galliopolis. I passed on until I saw some burnt leaves fall before me, next, I saw smoke on the other side of the river. I then moved on with all the force that I could muster, until I heard chopping, soon after, I saw the French garrison, which I could see about two miles, but I felt my weakness so that I had to sit down a number of times before one came opposite to the station. This was Friday, a little before sunset, it is a still evening, I hollowed so as to be heard. I was answered by one of the wheeling boys who was at the time, a hunter for the fort, his name was George Williams, he asked me who I was and what I wanted, told him that I was a lost man in distress, and wanted to get over, he then asked my name, and I told him, he then said I should be brought over immediately. So he sent a man with a canoe and took me over. The French inhabitants of the place seemed to be amazed at my situation and gathered round me in the attitude of examining me some supposing that I was a spy, but a certain squire Robertson, came into the crowd and took me by the hand, and led me to his log cabin, which had the string of the latch hanging out, and had an earthen floor. He first gave me some whiskey, I tasted. He then brought me some hominy fried in bear's oil which was very suitable food for my stomach, as well as pleasant to my taste, I therefore, took a few spoonfuls of the hominy but soon became very sick at my stomach. The squire then brought a bear skin and placed it on the earthen floor, I then lay down and slept myself well before bedtime. I then got up and ate some more of the hominy, when I returned to my bed and lay there until morning, I felt much recruited, except my feet, which were badly swollen, the bottoms of them seemed to be raised in blood blisters, while the tops were scratched with the briars, and cracked with the march winds until the blood was gushing out, but the squire gave me a pair of large dressed deerskin moccasins, with some flannel rags, dipped in bear's oil, to put on my feet and bade me travel about the town, so I obeyed him, and my feet mended fast so that in about a week I started for home. I went up the Conaway, where I found a trading keelboat, belonging to Dr. Wilkie, from Pittsburgh. I took passage to work for my board and had a good passage up to Fish Creek where I landed and got home the third day, where there was rejoicing, for the prodigal had returned home safe and sound. My father was now becoming by industry and economy throughout the whole family, to be tolerably well off, for he had two improvement rights, one he made by actual settlement, the other he bought each would hold 400 acres of land, by paying 10 pounds a hundred to the general land office. He managed to pay the fee of one tract of 400 acres, the other he gave a share to John Carmichael, for clearing it out of the office. So we began to live in tolerable good style, with the rest of the farmers of the backwoods of Pennsylvania. I was now in 20 years and had formed an acquaintance with a daughter of one of the pioneers of the neighborhood of the name of Kraft, but both of us being young we concluded it might be possible the attachment was of a childish nature. This however I found not to be the case, for in my greatest distress and in my camp, the first thought in my mind was of the dear object of my heart whom I had left in such agony and distress for my safety. Nor could I be easy after I got home until I paid her a visit and found that her heart was fixed and determined as mine. We renewed our pledges and waited for an opportunity to confirm the contract. After harvest, my father proposed to build a sawmill, as he wanted to build a new house and there was no sawmill handy. So he agreed with the millwright who came on, and in three weeks from the time that the first stick was cut, we had the frame up. We then had to dig for a foundation for the dam which was across a swampy bottom. This was in the month of November and cold freezing weather, so that we would have to break the ice when we went to work in the morning, and remain knee deep in the water all day, but we received no damage by the wet and cold, as we lay with our feet to the fire at night and occasionally took our bitters. But I still thought about marrying, which I concluded would make me happy, and about the beginning of the next year, which was 1792, I managed to dress some skins in bad weather, with which I bought a jacket and pair of breeches and went a trip with my father to Laurel Hill to buy his mill irons, and while there I prevailed on him to buy me a new coat of coarse broadcloth so that I was then nearly fixed with the wedding dress. I then dressed a skin and had me a pair of gloves made, and having obtained consent on both sides, which was a great task but which was obtained with less difficulty than we had expected we were finally married on the 16th of February 1792, three days before I was twenty years old. My father gave me a hundred acres of land amongst the hills and rocks, her father gave her a bed and a cow and two sheep. I also had a small horse. My land was in the woods, 
So I went to work to clear and fence a cornfield. The first day I split rails I split 320 in white oak timber, the timber is already cut. I got two acres cleared for corn, and about the same for wheat. But I shall come now to state some of the exercises of my mind which were various. Sometimes I would view the gloomy scenes of my travels on the Virginia bank of the Ohio, and reflected on the solemn vows that I had made behind the craggy rocks of the mountain, and then I would conclude that I would reform my life and live up to my vows, but I was often found myself to fail of performing anything that I thought was acceptable to God. Furthermore, I saw the purity of the divine law which saith, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, strength and mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. I found I failed in every particular, for my mind was carnal and of course was enmity to the law of God, it was not subject thereunto. The law appeared so just and true not one good duty could I do. But there remained a disposition to do something to recommend me to the favor of God. Sometimes I was encouraged to try to pray for mercy but always with some dependence on my own performance, for which I thought the Lord would have mercy on such a vile rebel as I was. But in the spring of 1793 there was a revival of religion in the neighborhood, and my younger brother, David, was soon delivered of his burden of sin, but I was still under condemnation, and thought I was not left behind, for one was taken and another left. So I seemed to go mourning all the day, I forsook my former companions in a great measure, though sometimes I was ensnared with their company which was a great grief to my mind, and helped to show me something of my own weakness and depravity. I was in the habit of going to Presbyterian meeting frequently and thought they were very good Christian people, but I had formed an attachment to Father David Sutton, who belonged to a church about ten miles from us, as the greatest gospel preacher and as my father, mother and oldest brother belonged to the church and commonly attended once a month, I sometimes went with them to try if I could get relief for my burden. The old man would tell me about my exercise and feelings in his sermons but could not give me the one thing needed, and he would tell me in conversation that it was easy to believe when the Lord's time was coming. My wife perceived that something ailed me, but did not know what it was. Sometimes I would retire to myself and try to ease my troubled mind, but it was all in vain as to my pain, for I still had a dependence on my own exertions, but in June 1793, if I mistake not, my wife and I went to meeting at the Baptist church where Elder Sutton preached. We went to the church meetings on Saturday, but my mind seemed to be enveloped in darkness, even a darkness that might be felt, and the temptations of the adversary seemed to be to give up all for lost, and try to take pleasure in sin, but to this, I could not yield too far, as I had got so much sight of the awful consequences of sin already. My mind was that night like the troubled ocean, that casteth up mire and dirt, but in the morning I was inclined to go away in secret where I could tell my wants to sovereign grace. So I went to a lonely thicket, but when I came there I seemed to be something like the publican, who dared not so much as lift up his eyes, and could scarcely utter the same words that he did, but concluded that my condemnation was sealed and that there certainly was no mercy for me. I walked slowly back to the house almost in desperation and bowed down like a bulrush. But oh the time of the singing of birds was near, for the Son of Righteousness was about to appear, with healing in his wings for as I advanced near the wall of the house, the door being shut, I heard the man of the house, reading in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. The first expression that seemed to raise my drooping spirits, was the fourth verse, Surely he hath borne our grief, and carried our sorrows etc. Fifth verse, But he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes, we are healed, and so on, through the chapter, as you can read at your leisure, which opened to my understanding and view, the great efficacy of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep, dumb, before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth, verse 7. I then stood amazed, for some time, and seemed as if I could mount as on the wings of an eagle, or that I could rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. The whole creation seemed to rejoice with me, so that the vegetable, as well as the brutal creation, seemed to bear a different aspect, but the poor sinner is brought by a way which he knew not and led in a path which he had not understood or trodden. Now I was ready to say, that Elder Sutton was right, for the Lord's is the best time, for he ever liveth to give repentance and remission of sins to Israel. I went to a meeting that day, which was Sunday, and seemed to feed on the preaching of the gospel, and the character of the Lord Jesus Christ, seemed to be like one altogether lovely, and desirable, the chiefest among ten thousand. But my summer did not last long, for I had not obtained what I had been seeking for. To be renewed or changed, both in body and mind, for my carnal mind was still enmity with God, but still, it grieved me to think of sinning against so good a Savior. 
I think I saw something of the malignity of sin, that had caused the Lord Jesus to sweat great drops of blood, and groan under the mighty burden, when he bore the sins of all his people, in his own body on the tree. I did not feel so much afraid of going to hell, or of being punished, as of disobeying or dishonoring so merciful and glorious a Savior as I had now found. But the inquiry was, Lord what shall I do? Or what can I do? Or zero Lord what wilt thou have me to do? I found the answer of Peter when the three thousand were pricked in their hearts. Ah but I am afraid said I, that I am deceived, and have not been pricked in the heart, like those penitents, under the powerful preaching of an apostle, newly baptized with the Holy Ghost. I felt so unworthy, I was afraid I would be a dishonor to the cause and bring reproach on the church if they could receive me. So I continued for some months. Sometimes bowed down, with the sense of neglect of duty, for I was not much at a loss respecting the mode of baptism, although I had been to the Presbyterian meetings more than I had been to the Baptist, and had gained a good opinion of them, as an orderly, respectable society in their way, but when I came to inquire seriously, for the mind of the Lord on the subject. Being as I humbly trust suitably brought down into the valley of humiliation, I could not receive an answer from men, nor according to human tradition, neither did consult with flesh and blood on the subject, but to the word and the testimony, where I learned that to be baptized is to be buried, and that Jesus was buried in Jordan's liquid stream when he was baptized, and they that take up their cross and follow him, must be buried with him in baptism. For he said come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, yea, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest to your souls, take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Thus I saw the Lord Jesus did not require an act of me by way of obedience, that he had not left the example in fair characters, so that the wayfaring man, though fool shall not err therein. So that any faithful render of the New Testament has no reason to be at a loss concerning the mode or subjects of baptism, which according to his arrangement, believers are the subjects, an immersion, or a burial, is the mode. But I was still afraid that I was not a fit subject, for my mind was darkened through corruptions of the flesh, and the deceitfulness of sin, so that I was ready to cry out, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me. But after some months, my brother Daniel inquired of me something concerning my hope, I told him that my hope was too small, he cited me to one of the old prophets, who said to spies not the day of small things, for they that do shall fall away by little and little, which bore heavy on my mind. So I concluded I would go to the monthly meeting again, and try if it would not relieve me in some measure, so I went, and my brother advised we to converse with the church, that they would likely give me some advice, that might be of some use to me. So when the church opened for the reception of members, I went forward, not that I felt like the church could relieve, but I wanted to relieve my mind. So I told them some of my former exercises, with a flood of tears, and when I was through, I went out with one of the brethren, while the church made up their minds, for so was the practice of that church, but we were soon called in, and the moderator gave me the right hand of fellowship, but I was afraid they were deceived. But the church left it with me when and where to be baptized. My request was that a meeting is appointed at my father's, near my house, where we frequently had meetings, that my wife and neighbors might have the opportunity of seeing me enter into the ranks, under the banner of King Emmanuel. So I was baptized according to the ancient order and enrolled in the church. But my warfare was just beginning, but having obtained help from God, I continue until this hour. We lived in Pennsylvania until we had six children, the youngest was more than a year old, in the spring of 1802, we moved to Ohio, Trumbull County, where we had seven more, which made thirteen, ten of which are yet one iving, and three are not. We lived in Ohio seventeen years, which brought 1819, we then moved into Indiana, and lived on Whitewater, Fayette County, two years and six months. Thence we moved to Blue River, where we have lived more than twenty years in Henry County, which brings three scores and ten to the number of my age, and may I not say with my namesake of old, to Pharaoh. Few and full of sorrow have the days of the pilgrimage of thy servant been. Our children are all married, and had families, before my companion died, in May 16, 1841, and their children number thirty-two living, and great-grandchildren five. The object of the foregoing is not for speculation, nor a display of talents, which the reader will readily perceive, but are limited at best. But that the present, and rising generation, and in particular my own children, and grandchildren, and their children, may in after ages, read in my own dialect, or diction, 
a few instances of the many thousand cases of sufferings amongst the revolutionary, as well as the pioneers of the West. This concludes our two-part series on the sketches of Jacob Parkhurst. Thank you for taking the time to listen to Thumb Wind's End of the Road podcast. If you like this kind of story, you are invited to join our 15,000 monthly visitors on our website at thumbwind.com. Please watch for and download the next historical story over the next several weeks. Please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast and give us a review. From the end of the road. Have a great day.